Scott, you, you uh, had a post uh, where you were talking about extracts. Um, are, are you moving more towards extracts versus compost teas? And then can you talk a little bit about extracts versus teas and kind of for sure your, your mindset? For sure. So I think really, you know, kind of the confusion that's happened is, you know, there's Dr. Elaine Ingham who's, who came up with all these methods and, you know, she's kind of known for saying tea, saying tea, saying tea, compost tea, compost tea, compost tea. And what happens is people then go just do any version of what they define as tea. So there's a extreme variation between what Dr. Elaine Ingham defines as compost tea and what the market does across the board. Uh, I, I can't think of anything that's more varied in any thing I've ever done in my entire life. And so the two major obstacles with compost tea is you're doing, you're doing animal husbandry, you're growing animals and you're, you're growing life in a tank and, and you either are or are not quantifying those organisms. Uh, most of the people that possess a microscope just kind of look through, um, which isn't bad, but there's a lot that you can't see if you're just looking through. Um, in the early years, there was a lot of uh, really bad information as far as organism identification. So I feel like an entire community went chasing after the wrong goal because of a couple key people. Um, I think that's starting to get sorted out a little bit now that Dr. Laningham's courses are far more accessible. But essentially what we ran into in the workplace is, you know, really the first few jobs I got were to teach people how to brew tea. And what that would look like is I would go to the facility, we would set up a recipe, I would verify with the microscope that it was what it needed to be. And then we would replicate it over multiple days so I could leave them with a compost tea recipe. Um, through that first year, it became really apparent the problems with that because what ends up happening is the climate changes, the temperature changes, the conditions change for that life. And I don't think, you know, the market at wide really understands how varied those results of compost tea brewing can be. And when we start to communicate to people these obstacles and we say you need to be checking and and it kind of turns into this like class warfare emotions. Like people get offended. Like I'm saying you're not qualified to do this, but I mean, technically that's what's happening. And, and, and if you want to brew tea, you should become proficient at identifying organisms to actually quantify them because you're either brewing life or you're either brewing disease. And we went from facility to facility and facility, and we just kept tracking the issues with people brewing tea. Around that same time, like from like 2014 to 2016, I think Dr. Elaine really started switching more to the extract model. And so the benefits of tea is you excite organisms and they produce glues and they stick to surfaces. That's great if you're covering leaves. If you're trying to penetrate to roots, they never get to the roots, they stick to the soil surface. So Dr. Elaine was seeing a benefit to adding compost extract to the soil versus compost tea because it the compost extract you're dislodging organisms into water and then those organisms will travel as far as the water does and so you actually get to the desired result quicker using a compost extract versus versus a compost tea now the downside of the compost extract is you use more compost but the upside is there's almost no volatility um, there's almost no detriment that can come with it as long as your compost doesn't have detrimental aspects to it. And so at the small scale, you can brew some compost tea, but as we started to get bigger and bigger and bigger, we ran into remarkable obstacles at scale. Um, I don't necessarily say this publicly because then I get nasty emails and things from people that manufacture tea equipment, but the larger the tank you go, the worse it gets. Um, the last thing that you want, in my opinion, is a 500 to 1,000 gallon tea brew. And I apologize to the people, but that's the math of it. Um, and so there's a lot of obstacles to brewing tea because you're trying to do it on a timeline. Like you're trying to, you're trying to reproduce rabbits on a perfect time scale that fits into the commercial space and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so if you start a tea brew that has a 24 hour life cycle and you come in next morning, but then you, you discover an irrigation leak 
and you get occupied for four hours. Well, now that tea that may have would have been healthy is now full of disease and problematic. And then you put that onto your plants. So there's a lot of issues with tea at scale. Um, compost extract is far lower volatility. Again, we start moving up in scale. We're not working with technically trained people. We're working with agricultural employees sometimes. And so it's far easier to explain to a non non-trained employee how to do a compost extract. I thought the fascinating part that you guys discovered was how the difference in high elevation and low elevation, lack of oxygen and those kind total of things. Total nightmare. Yeah, it's a total nightmare. And that, you know, like I said, 2015, 2016, that was really the first jobs we got was teaching people how to brew tea because that's really all they knew from Dr. Lane. They knew that we were involved with Dr. Lane. They wanted to get in. And so now what my wife and I do is – you know, we show up with a couple 55 gallon drums and a pump and a sump pump and a 130 foot hose. And I mean, you know, the wife and I can apply compost extract to 30,000 square feet in a work day. Yeah. You know, we just, we just, and it's, and it's no volatility. It cleans out. You can rinse out the thing because what we also started working, what running into is you run into OSHA now. If you're trying to do a regulated facility, you got an OSHA person making sure you conform. You cannot have an employee climb up on a ladder to get into a 250 gallon tank in a regulated facility. And it's just not going to fly. And so now you got to build a platform and it just, you're multiplying problems to do something that we don't necessarily advocate. And, you know, for, for Sarah and I, the real like profound aha moment that will by far go down is one of the most profound experiences I've had in any workplace is, we were trying to brew tea at a facility that hired us to treat two that were about 15 miles apart. And we were racing back and forth to set tea brews at both facilities. And we came to the one facility, it was getting dark, it was outside, we were running out of time. And at that time we were using like 200, 300 gallon tanks. We'd put compost tea bags in there. We'd aerate it for 20, 30 minutes. We'd swap them out. We'd do that a couple of times until we hit the targeted values. And we just didn't have enough time to do that. And so Sarah was like, well, I'll just hand extract the amount of compost into a five gallon bucket. We'll pour it into the top of the tea brew and top it off and go home and get dinner. And the funny part about it was she did it faster than me and she got better extraction rates because the hand extraction rate was more efficient than the aerated in the 300 gallon tank. And that, we haven't looked back since. People don't want to hear it. Um, they're not impressed by that. We, we, there's a lot of jobs that don't hire us because they want these wizardy tea brewers. But, you know, proof's in the pudding. We, we haven't turned back since, you know. And it's far easier for me to show up to a facility with two blue barrels, blust out the extract, wash it out, turn it upside down and get in. And, and you know, that's, you know, previously I used to, advocate like 55 gallon brewers and we were using these stainless steel ones and we'd have our facilities get them yeah you know, i'm I a big guy that. you remember when it fell on the employee yeah so that tank fell on one of the employees because she saw me and i i would always try to be really careful to not fill it up with water and move it but i screwed up and i needed it to go like 30 feet to the left and i'd already filled it up and i was just kind of end of day tired stressed and so i picked i was kind of dragging this tank down this concrete thing to the next row. Well, the non-English speaking agricultural employee that had to execute that task after I left did that same thing. And she pulled a 55 gallon stainless steel brewer on top of her. And that was the end of that game. I was, I was like, that's not going down at all. And so, you know, a lot of these workplace scenarios of practicality, like I think that's where Eric and I really are very similar in that we always want to find the most practical low cost, easy solution. And, you know, people that make and sell brewers don't want to hear it. People that want to buy brewers don't want to hear it. But I'm telling you, we get remarkable results using small barrels. And it, it, most employees want to clock in and clock out. Exactly. It's, it, you know, it, it, as much as everybody wants to be in cannabis and wants that job in it or whatever, it, it, a lot of people turn it into the clock in and clock out. And if you don't make it easy, and somewhat desirable, it just becomes, you know, mm -hmm. it becomes exactly. the next guy's job and the new guy exactly. and the next, and it just exactly. moves on. And so a lot of these jobs, 
you know, we're not saying everything's easy. There's work involved, but you have to make it safe first of all. And if it's Mm -hmm. not safe, that's an issue. And secondly, if it's not something that people are like feeling passionate about, it drives down morale exactly. because you're working with a big team of people and it, all it takes is one, you know, seedling or one, you know, uh, cell to start to have that, um, mm-hmm. you know, uninspired attitude and it drags the whole bunch down. And yeah. a lot of these corporate facilities don't give a fuck about you know, they're not there to make friends. So, I yeah. mean, you can, you, they see that shit and you're gone quick. So, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, making these facilities smooth and, and enticing for employees is important because, yeah. again, once you start getting to that clock in, clock out, passion drives down and we're not actually leveling up at yeah. that point. Well, what what, hap- what kind of evolved us to the barrels is we were, we were working on a large ag project. We don't just do cannabis. We do anything. Um, and we did a farm that was 6,000 acres of corn and soy. And we had like six 250-gallon um T brewers that were in IBC totes, um, which kind of solves a problem at scale, but I have objections to as well. But nonetheless, we were running those. And so Sarah and I developed the SOP and and determined how many minutes, how much compost, how much time, what process yields the appropriate result. And then we turn that over to employees. And as soon as the employees take over that job, we start having problems with the numbers on the extract. We start getting undesirable aspects to it. The quality goes down because they're not able to clean it. They're not super motivated to climb in that thing and scrub it like we do. So you start to lose repeatability. And so that's really where the 55 gallon barrel excels is that it's small, it's compact, it's consistent. It keeps it even, it keeps it in small enough batches to go from space to space to space. And, and it's repeatable and it's easy to clean out. And we see this in other areas, like Frenchy Cannoli doesn't make hash in a 400 gallon barrel. He makes it in the same damn size that the little washing machines are because you get better extraction rates and you get more consistency. And so we just tried to replicate that model. And like Eric says, is produce a standard operating procedure that's not painful to an employee, that doesn't add undue process or headache or reasons to get yelled at or any of that thing and the 55 gallon drum solves all those problems it keeps the extract into a small container so you don't magnify variation Um, you get really consistent dispensing of organisms across the property from corner to corner and most employees can rinse it out with a hose and turn it upside down and clean it properly which is the actual goal Um, and that is one of the major components that's missing from the commercially produced tea brewers that is becoming very apparent in the regulated market. And we've worked with some facilities in Vegas, which has a remarkably difficult microbial things to navigate. And we tracked several facilities over the course of a year and saw microbial issues popping up with certain types of tea brewers in process. And again, you know, we moved away from a lot of types of equipment and, you know, as unsexy it is and as disappointing as it is, we by <laughs> far get the best results using a couple blue barrels and a hundred dollar pump from Home Depot. You know? Like you know. if you, if you listen to Dr. Ingham, mm-hmm. so much of compost tea was really designed to do the glue binding it was to bind the particles so that you start to have the ability to take soil that had inadequate uh, uh, tilth and increase it. And we started using it as these inoculants. And the thing was that as you start to learn, you're, you're not qualified on the microscope, so you have no idea what you're brewing. And you end up seeing pathogenic problems resulting from your work because you're kind of using voodoo science. And I think the compost extract is excellent because it's, you, you're, you're able to take what you want to take and put it in. But I think that compost tea designed for you know building ground that isn't ready for cultivation and preparing it laying the cover crops in binding the soil gluing it together i think that's the purpose of it more than sure. where the way we use it sure you know because i was I, I was a brewer too and i got yeah. to a size in brew tank where i was probably like 250 but it, it got to the size where it was i gotta climb up in the damn thing to clean it it becomes yep. a nightmare Yep. You can't flip it. It starts to become too big to service. Yeah. Yep. And I didn't want a centralized monster tank to feed through because I'm like, you start leaving residue in the lines. You're starting mm-hmm. to have 
pathogenic contamination because it has to be clean. And you start to realize you're doing the same thing. You're starting in a closet and you're trying to multiply it out to acreage. Yeah. And, and gonna... yeah. And, and also too, it's a, it, you know, what we do now is also a, you know, millions of square feet, feet of evolution and, and compost tea is a remarkably powerful tool. You know, one of our counterparts, Nick Tomasini, goes by Humankind Oregon. He uses a lot of compost tea. And, you know, if you properly brew tea and you get it onto the plants, I mean, next morning there's a new branch. It's some wild oh, yeah, shit. Yeah. I mean, if you do it right and you hit the numbers that Dr. Elaine defines, it's pure witchcraft. But a lot of times the compost tea is a fourth quarter decision, not the way Nick uses it, but like to combat disease or whatever. So you're throwing a Hail Mary at fourth quarter. And, you know, what my wife and I have done if gone was like, how do we circle back to the very beginning to circumvent problems to not need a fourth quarter decision? And that strategy is getting back to a compost extract, starting at the beginning, starting with organisms that are distributed evenly from corner to corner, start with a tank that doesn't also bring disease, and then monitor that process effectively and appropriately. So, you know, you can't, you can avoid, or excuse me, you can take a compost tea and you can knock out powdery mildew. Uh, we've done it before. We used to do it back in the earlier years, but it was just, it was too complicated as a business strategy. So we stopped doing it, but you can come up to a facility and stop a whole bunch of nightmares with a really good tea, but we can also go back to propagation, start fresh, start with a good extract, use the microscope to quantify your trajectory as you go from start to finish. And you can avoid getting mold by making watering changes, by making feed changes, by, you know, in a lot of cases making environmental changes. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, what came with regulation for us is, you know, prior in the, in the black markets, it was a by all means necessary approach. You could spray microbutanol in the last week if you really felt like that's what you were going to do. And because we can't do these, we have to get back to the beginning of the root cause, identify what the actual issue is, and avoid hitting that island altogether. <laughs>